Give me time to think it over. Luther asked for 24 hours to consider the situation. Eck and the whole assembly were amazed. How could this supreme intellectual leader of this movement ask for more time to think? Was he succumbing to fear? Roland Bainton, the great Luther historian, answers, Anyone who recalls, recalls Luther's tremors at his first mass will scarcely so interpret this hesitation. Just as then he wished to flee from the altar, so now he was too terrified before God to give an answer to the emperor. So that night, Luther and his colleagues passionately called out on God in now celebrated prayers. And so with the rising of the sun, another larger hall was chosen, and it was so crowded that scarcely anyone except the emperor could sit. Eck spoke long and eloquently in the flickering candlelight, concluding, I ask you, Martin, answer candidly and without horns. Do you or do you not repudiate your books and the errors which they contain? And this is, again, Luther against the religious establishment, against the world that he knew. He spoke and his voice rang. He spoke first in German and then in Latin. And he said, Since then your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply, I will answer without horns and without teeth, unless I am convinced by Scripture and by plain reason. I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God, help me. Amen. Because he feared God, he was freed from the fear of man. Oliver Cromwell said the same thing, this English military and po political leader. He said, based, he said this, he said, fear God and you will have no one else to fear. That's exactly what Jesus is teaching here. When you fear God, you have no one else to fear. So the remedy for hypocrisy is to forget about what others may say about you, think about you, or do to you as long as you are living the truth of God's word. That's what Luther did. That's what Jesus taught. So don't be a hypocrite. And the way you do that is don't fear what men can say, do, or think about you as long as you're living righteously. And then he goes, God loves you and he's going to take care of you. Look at the next verse, verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings and not one of them is forgotten? Key word. Not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Here's the fifth time he says fear. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Look, God is going to take care of you when you live out the truth and are not afraid of man. He'll not forget about you. God takes care of the sparrows. They're the least of all his creatures. In another passage, if, if some of you like to do numbers or crunch, crunch numbers, okay, in Matthew, let's see where, where it's at here. In Matthew, Jesus says, in Matthew 10, 29, two sparrows are sold for a farthing. Aren't two sparrows sold for a farthing? In other words, you get two sparrows for one copper coin. But here he says, aren't five sparrows sold for two farthings? And so what'd you get? You got one thrown in for free. You buy four, get one free. See this? And Jesus says in this text, text right here, what may be of no commercial value to man is remembered by God. Even this very small thing. And you are worth much more than a sparrow. He's going to take care of you. How much more will he provide for his people who are the greatest of his creation? God, if God cares for that odd sparrow in the group of five, how much more will he watch over and take care of you? And then he throws in, he even knows the numbers of the hair on your head, right? And some of us, it's getting less and less, <laughs> right? But he knows, even when that hair falls off or when you pull it off. <laughs> Let's go on to verse 8. 
following on the heels of that. God's going to love you. God's going to take care of you. God won't forget about you as long as you fear, fear not man and do right. And then verse 8, Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. So don't fear. God's going to take care of you. Confess Christ. Just keep going. Keep walking. The believer we see in the Son of God here in verses 8 and 9, acknowledges, confesses, okay? Any, any believer that acknowledges or confesses Christ will be acknowledged by Christ himself and acknowledged by God. Confess means to say the same or to acknowledge. In essence, here in the context, those who confess who I am, those who receive me as Messiah as I am, look, God is, God is not, God, he's going to acknowledge you. It's not a means of salvation. It's an indication that you're saved. If I confess Christ, it just demonstrates, look, I am a Christ follower. So the point of verse 8, 9, and, and 10 here is that, look, you have to make a choice. Are you going to acknowledge me as who I am, Messiah, the King, Lord? If you recognize him, then you have access to salvation. If you deny him, there is no other salvation. And in verse 10, Jesus carried that, that logic one step further, saying that, look, who bl blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. It's almost as if he says, hey, you can, you can blaspheme against Jesus, but uh, the Holy Spirit is more important. Okay, he's not saying that, but it almost seems like, like it that way. Okay, here's an example of someone, the Apostle Paul, before he became Apostle Paul, or Paul, Saul. Did he blaspheme Jesus? Yeah. People were taking off their robes and laying it at his feet when they stoned Stephen. And here is Stephen saying, Father, forgive them. Lay not this into their charge. And so, in act, he denied Christ, the Son of Man. That's what verse 10 right, says. Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man. But on the road to Damascus, Jesus says to him, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, isn't it? It's hard for you. Your conscience, this Holy Spirit is witnessing to you. And you know what? Paul is not resisting or blaspheming the Holy Spirit. He is sensitive to the Holy Spirit's prodding and pointing to the point where Paul says, What will you have me to do, Lord? Paul, right, lived that right before us. So what does it mean here when it says at the end of verse 10, but unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. He's, in regards to the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they knew in their hearts that everything he did pointed to his fact, the fact of him being the Messiah. You've heard the statement, there are none so blind who will not see. They chose not to see the truth of his words and his works and his ministry. And what they were actually doing is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Jesus was doing all these miracles, pointing himself to be the Son of God and the Messiah, and they rejected the Holy Spirit's testimony. They even said, I think this is what blaspheme, uh, the unpardonable sin in that context, right? was that they saw Jesus' miraculous works, they attributed it to Beelzebub or to the devil, and Jesus says, look, there is, there's, there's nothing that can be done for you. You're not going to be forgiven when you reject the Holy Spirit's witness in your life. That exact sin can't be committed today because physically Christ isn't on the earth today doing miracles where you can say, oh, he's doing miracles in the power of the devil. However, the Spirit of God witnesses through his word. It's possible for sinners to reject that witness and to resist the truth that the Spirit is bringing to their hearts and minds. The Apostle Paul didn't. You knew he was weighed down in his conscience by the witness of the Holy Spirit, and one day he just repented. The unpardonable sin today, okay, is just rejecting Jesus. There is no place for forgiveness if you don't accept the only place of forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. So let's finish here. The last words here as we see him in verse 11. 
confess Christ, and then verse 11, and when they bring you into the synagogues and unto the magistrates and the powers, take ye no thought how or what you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. So in regards to believing the Son and believing the Spirit, believe them both. Now in regards to being brought before the, the, civil, the civil, you know, the government, as well as the religious establishment, in that regard, when they bring you to be judged or on trial, depend on him. Depend on Jesus Christ. Depend on the Holy Spirit. Confess Jesus openly, boldly, freely. Don't become distracted by defending yourself. Speak from your heart as God has worked in your heart already. The Holy Spirit will speak. As was read in the scripture reading this morning, Peter learned the lesson. How did he say it? He said, be ready always to give an answer for the hope that is in you to everyone that asks with meekness and fear. That's Peter's practical application of what Jesus has just said here. Be ready. The Holy Spirit's going to speak to you. Just be ready through you. So as I close here, listen. The big ideas, the takeaway is this. Look, are you faking it? Are you a phony? Are you wearing a mask? Are you a hypocrite? Let me just tell you, there are born-again Christians and there's cultural Christians. There's religious Christians who are not born again. In fact, I think the coming persecution will be the church against the church. Those who call themselves Christians and who are not, who will persecute those who try to live every word according to this book. So are you a true Christian, are you a phony? If you know you're a phony, the remedy for you is to confess it. God, forgive me. I'm a hypocrite. I'm a phony. And then confess it to those who you tried to be phony to. And for the most part, they'll know. They already know you're a phony. Come to the light, acknowledge who you are, and trust Jesus Christ. Now, second question, if you're fearful, if you're fearful, let's just redirect that fear, not fear of man or fear of circumstance, but fear of God. Redirect it to the fear of God. Turn your fear from this plane to this plane, because if I fear God, then this plane I have nothing to fear. If we fear God as we ought to, we'll not be afraid of anyone or anything will not be afraid to say anything that God would have us to say. Confess Christ joyfully. Live it out. Let people see the joy of your life. Live it consistently. Speak about him whenever you can. And lastly, you say, you know what, Pastor, I, I'm real. I'm for real. I'm not the best that I should be. I'm not fearful, but, you know, I do get worried. You know, some people worry in different ways. Some people, I mean, if I worry, it's, it's my mind. I can't stop thinking about how to solve a problem, and I can't sleep well. Some people, it's right here, right? It, their gut, they can't keep anything down. If you're a worrier, pray. Pray about it. Worry about nothing, pray about everything. The short version of Philippians 4, 6. Worry about nothing. Rather than overthinking a situation, rather than having an upset stomach because of worry, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Peter would say that. And then after you cast your care upon him, he says, do this, then do it. Okay? Cast all your fear, take action on what he says for you to do. So in closing, listen, be on guard against hypocrisy and don't be afraid because God cares for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you that you are the God of all grace, that you have patience with your people. As a shepherd, you lead your sheep. As a shepherd, you feed your sheep. You feed us with the good things of your word, that spiritual meat, that rich milk, that sweet honeycomb of the word of God. Thank you 
that you make us strong through your word that we might not fear. Help us, Lord, to always exercise a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward men, that we be not hypocritical in our lifestyle, but ever, Lord, help us to be children of light, living joyfully in righteousness and joy in the Holy Ghost as we seek to please you in all that we do. Thank you that we can have confident living because we fear you, we reverence you, we hold you in awe, and confidently we can live knowing that you care for us, knowing that you give us words to say when we need them, knowing that you, Lord, are after our good in your glory. Help us to bow the knee and then help us to rise to live for you in this present world. Not wearing masks, living according to truth, and fearing you and no one else. For we pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please stand with me, and uh, we're going to close in the doxology. Again, my wife and I will.